catchphrases or nothing like that yet that we say when we're opening or nothing like that, right? No, we don't have any. I think this is it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Steve. And I'm Sean. And we're Working Class Zeros, and today this is our third episode yeah, of hope, Working Class Zeros. Hopefully this one's not quite as long as the last Cheers. one. Cheers. That's our plan is to make this one a little bit more uh, concise. And as you notice, we are actually outside today. We decided to shoot on location rather than in my practice room, which is a lot smaller. And sure. it's, uh, you know, it's okay. But it's a nice day out. We should be outside. Absolutely. Let's in, let's enjoy the day. Get that vitamin D in, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so why don't we kick off? So we said uh, we have three, we normally have three topics, mm -hmm. and then we have, sure, it's cool, but is it necessary, right? Right. That's always the one. Is it Sure, it's cool, but is it necessary? So why don't we start off with talking about our first topic, which... I find was really interesting is that uh, John Patushi released a video recently, and um, it was on Instagram. I don't know. I sent it to you. I yep. think because I was I, like, yeah, I was I like, this it. is like, this hits at your heartstrings, right? It was sure. It was such a, uh, it was such a, um, it was so, it was so uh, emotional, mm -hmm. and the connection, and, and really what he said in it was basically, you know, is it okay to turn down a gig? Well, it was very much on brand with kind of like the types of things that we talk about with, you know, it's like being the fact that you're a working musician and having to get your priorities straight and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, like, I thought it was a really interesting uh, video and like his opinions on it. Like we're basically in line with what I think we where we fall with a lot of this stuff. He must have been watching some of our videos or something. Like <laughs> Maybe that. he's yeah. tuning in. <laughs> John, if you're tuning in, send us a message. We'd love to catch up with you. Sure. <laughs> you yeah. know, he, he lives on the East Coast again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, just a insider. I know his. Uh, I think his father-in-law, or his father, his father-in-law, was actually at Moravian Village for a while, which is in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So he would walk around here. He was a big fan of fly fishing. So he, John was making his own flies for a little bit. He doesn't really talk about that much, but John is uh, quite a fly fisherman. There you uh, go. Told me that when uh, last time I saw him, uh, which was I think at the base boot camp. So some inside baseball there. Yeah. Okay. So I think he brings up a relevant, a relevant point. Base boot camp, yeah. <laughs> I think he brings up a relevant point, which was, um, you know, is it okay to turn down a gig? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when we think about those things, it's like, is it okay? And I know that a lot of times when you're hungry and you're like, hey, I'm, I want to play. And when you're young, you do want to play a lot of gigs. That's ideal. You know, you want to play as many gigs as you can. But in something like this, it's like, you know, sometimes yeah. you, you have to kind of take into account, is it? You know, what's the family situation, right? Well, you know what? And that's something that develops over time because, like, uh, we both said it before, and Patatucci even said it himself, where when you're young, you're hungry, you want to gig all the time. And, like, I've instructed, like, young students that were looking to try and, like, you know, go to get out there and try to maybe become, like, professional musicians and whatnot to just go out there and say yes. Say yes to like all the gigs that keep coming your direction because you don't know what's going to develop, where things are kind of go, who you might meet because a lot of it's about the hang and like yeah. how you're gonna like interact with people. So like say yes in the beginning. Yeah. But like we're not those young guys anymore. No. no. So now we have priorities that are outside of just well, like our <clears throat> desire to play music. Can I left turn on that for a second? Yeah. I, sure. I like what you said, but I think that you ha also have to look at the relevance of staying in your lane too it's like yeah you can take the gigs but you have to kind of like you know it's like if you take any gig it's it's the the jack of all trades master of none mm -hmm. right There's so you that. do you do want to focus in and i think that's where you know that's the other side of this is like if you are going to take a lot of gigs and family's a priority you know hey I don't, i'm not going to take every gig you want to be as proficient at the gig that you do take so that you're not putting in all that extra time so it's like hey this is pulling me out here so it's like you know, and some guys are great. They go from jazz to metal to country, and they'll do everything they can do. And you do learn a lot from that, but I think you have to know where your strengths and your weaknesses are. And if you do choose to go down that, that road of, of, like, taking any gig, and I know that's, like, a broader umbrella there, mm -hmm. but when you do take that any gig scenario, I think what happens is that you spend a lot more time in the practice room, in the practice space, and then that's going to pull you out before you even get on the, the gig. So if you are doing the tour or you are doing a run or whatever you're doing with, with the band, um, it's going to pull you in a different direction. And, and time in the practice room is not time spent with, like, you know, family in, like, our scenarios. Like, for us, like, who have been gigging for some time now, trying to maybe uh, change the direction and where we're playing... <laughs> that would be a huge hindrance on our own personal lives of like having to try and like 
learn the standards of a d- totally different genre. Like, you know, like I, both of us are pretty proficient with like the rock and like, you know, just like uh, the, the classic tunes that are always played out the bars jazz and whatnot. World. And like for you, you have a little bit more proficiency with like knowing all your jazz standards yeah. than I would. I mean, like, could I sit down and read a real book? Yes, I could do that. But you would actually be like the guy who's a little bit more proficient in that direction than I would be. I probably know if not the same amount, if not a little bit more like niche, like rock tunes. But like that's just something that happens with like the directions you end up going, where you're focusing. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I did a lot of rock stuff. You've done a lot of jazz things. But like there's overlap, and I think you know, like, just uh, if I wanted to go and learn like country now, yeah. like that's going to be like a huge, you know, like, uh, undertaking with like time and commitment. Yeah. So I, I think I think so, I think the broad, like I said, the broader spectrum here or the broader umbrella is. You know, is it okay to turn down the gig? Mm-hmm. So I think that's a factor is do you need to learn it as much? So it's like turning down a gig. It's like, can you jump into the gig quickly and easily? Sometimes that's a, like a matter of, okay, then I do it. Mm-hmm. It's it's less time I'm taking away from the family. Does it pay well? Yes. Then it's a, then it's a great opportunity. But if it's something that's going to like, unless you're willing to take on an undertaking that's like huge and it's going to, it's going to suck that time away from you because you need to spend 10, 12 hours of, of time just prepping the material to make sure that you are uh, conscious of where everything is, it may it may take some time. So you, mm. you kind of want to think about where you're going with this. Yeah, and the, the direction, like which what we were just talking about before, if this is somewhere where you want to be, if you want to be going and doing something, for example, like the tribute shows, okay, that's a big undertaking with like learning the material and having to get it down to where like you're either memorizing it or like you can read it and play it exactly how it is on the record. Like you have to you have to put the time in to learn that material. If that's something you want to do, then that's you know where your priorities kind of like lean to when it comes to the music stuff. If it, you're just taking the gig to take the gig, that's a lot of time you're going to be uh, spending for probably very little payout. You might might not get called back yeah. you know like all those types of things these are the factors you have to weigh out so i don't know like if it was something that i didn't see a future in i just was like offered an opportunity to go and do something like maybe i just say no to it or maybe i have something else going on that i would rather be like my time's better spent like with the family that weekend yeah. than it is traveling to make 300 bucks absolutely absolutely and i think we can both agree on that so i think I, w- I would agree that, you know, you have to choose, pick and choose where your priorities lie. Now, if your priorities, like if you're young and you don't have a family, you don't have a, a day gig, you don't have all these other things that you're dependent on, take the gig, take the gig, take the learning experience. Sure. Uh, but as you, as life becomes more complicated and more complex in, in, its, in its small eccentricities, you know, kids, wife, family, payments, uh, credit cards, bills, whatever... You have to you have to really think about what is the priority. Maybe the priority isn't, you know, you know, driving two hours to make a hundred dollars, which you could have made a different way, or just staying home. You would have probably saved money without driving. Yeah, you, you could make that with a couple of students like anymore these days. You know, you have like, like a two like one hour students or something like that. You charge them each like forty bucks for the hour or fifty bucks for the hour. You made yourself a hundred bucks now. You, you know? just go to work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, but I'm just saying, like, for like those who are going yeah. in the musician route, okay, be a little bit more like I don't know, uh, I guess, thrifty with your time yeah. and understand like how to mm. how to like, make the most out of it. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely something special about being on stage, and we love interacting with other musicians. That's definitely a high point for most of us. But I'm just saying, like, as as we start to look into where the future leads and what your needs are, you do want to definitely consider what what you're taking what the on what you're taking on mm-hmm. all right so let's transition because we don't want to spend right. we don't want to beat this dead horse yeah right? we, we got it <laughs> okay. we got it covered so so that that was speaking of john's statement on instagram and if you haven't seen it please look it up look up john patucci on instagram it's uh he's always great uh, i love john great insight uh, great insight yeah. uh great musician incredible bass player mm. uh d- definitely look it up it's worth the v- it's worth the watch I think the next thing we were going to talk about, because it is rolling into summer, we're still in spring. It finally feels like spring here in Pennsylvania. Uh, finally, I think we finally were able to take jackets off this week, which I is... I think, yeah, the new Seattle weather just finally went away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we are going to roll into talking about summer festivals. Mm. The summer festival. You know, it was... Uh, all of us want to play them. We all like them. You know, but when you think about the time frame of a summer festival, there's, there's, there's pros and cons. Now... Yeah. One of the pros is it's summer, <laughs> you know. 
and you get to play in front of a lot of people. Yeah, normally it's, and it, sometimes it, it kind of almost feels like an exclusive club for those who get the invite to come and play. It's like I get to be one of those artists. I'm an artist that gets invited to go and play the summer festivals. Yeah, it sounds like almost like a badge you want to wear, like it's an honor. Like, I did it. It's like I a did Jeep, it, guys. It's like a Jeep badge, you know. <laughs> you got your trail badge. Yeah, it, it is cool. Like there's definitely it's 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 fun to play a summer festival, but I think. The, when you look behind the scenes on the summer festival of what the pain is like, I know like when we play it and we play we play them a lot, and uh, the money isn't the money it doesn't pay well. It oh, pays no. slightly better than a regular gig. Um, <laughs> sometimes some pay better depends on who the artist is you're you're accompanying or if you're doing sure. your own thing. If you're doing your own thing, it's probably going to pay slightly better than what you normally make. You know. Yeah. Um, some of the downsides are, of course, that you don't make the money back, uh, depending on how far you have to travel for the summer festival. You know, where is it at? How far do you have to drive? Are you gonna, you know, what's the ROI on it? What's the return on investment? I always feel that's a that's a big factor with any of these because it's when you think about it, Sean. You know, it's like you put all this time and effort, and you think that a, that the festival as a band that you're gonna you're gonna gain a lot of following. You're gonna get these people. They're gonna love you. They're gonna buy your stuff if you have stuff, right? Yeah. That's the other thing. Like, how many times we play, or you see people play, and and, right. and they don't bring anything with them to sell. So it's like that's a mistake too. Yeah, and but then you also need to also factor it in. Like, if you were the person that came and attended the festival, it's like, are you really that special? Like that you think you're gonna like really gain that kind of traction from these types of performances? Honestly, it's basically just a bar gig in a lot of scenarios with just a little bit more flash to it because it's outdoors. Yeah, it's got, it's got a, a sound stage system. Lights. Stage lights. Yeah, stage lights, a sound system. Sometimes there's even an engineer who's Ooh. running the sound. Yeah. Ooh, and <laughs> subwoofers. Oh yeah, so I mean, like, if you're a bass player like us, like, it's like, ooh, that feels good. Yeah, like the bass always sounds great on stage. <laughs> Out there, it doesn't sound any different than if you just had like your like a two by ten. <laughs> oh, it's it's. I mean, the summer festival there is benefits. It's fun to play. It's something yeah. to look forward to. You put it on your calendar. You promote it on social media. Yeah, and, I shouldn't and... sound completely jaded about the whole summer <laughs> festival thing, but there's so many downsides. There to is. It. You know, one of the things is like, you know, if not not if you're like if you're a touring band and you have a you have a either the band van that or the bus or however you're getting around if you're on that level different scenario you're probably doing multiple summer festivals mm -hmm. now if you're if you're on the if you're on that other spectrum of like the working stiff where you're like hey we're going to play this festival and then we're going to play this festival over here you're probably driving in on your own you're not even you're not even carpooling at that point which probably means not. that you know you know sure there's the gas money but there's also the parking uh, situation dude the the parking situation is the one thing that always gives me like anxiety <laughs> about like these festivals because there's so many bands like like so like you might be like advertising that like, you're playing this festival or something like that but like there's also like 50 other bands that are advertising that they're playing that day as well yep. and there and you figure like all right 50 bands and you got like let's say it's just four piece bands mm -hmm. like so that's 200 musicians right there that are showing up and they all need to try and find parking and a lot of them are going to get there early in the day and spend the entire day there so there's very limited parking available for like the talent that's showing up for like these festivals yeah. so you end up having to try and find like street parking or you're or you're walking a long distance from like a parking garage or like sometimes they'll give you like a parking pass but the parking pass doesn't really do anything for you because all the spaces are taken anyway. So, like, it's really just kind of, like, a waste, you know? And, like, it's one of those things where I, I'm like, oh, my God, I hate doing that. Like, they're, they're, like you know, yeah. the, some of the music festivals around here, like, you know, in our area and stuff like that, it's very, very difficult to get, like, parking. And uh, it's one of those things where, like, I... I I just have to deal with it. I just I yeah. got to get over it. I think it's the same anxiety that I get when I get on a plane with my bass. You know, it's like, sure. will it make it in the overhead? Will I find a closet to put my bass in on the plane? Or am I going to have to gate check it? And that's that's always like the fear is like, do I have to gate check this? And I think we've all been there where it's like, you know, you're, you're pulling up to the festival and where it, where are you, you're, you know, you're, do you need to bring your own back line? That's mm -hmm. always the thing too. It's like, if you have to bring your own back line, and there's always that band that decides to bring their own back line, and then you have to pull everything off the stage oh and get goodness, out of their yeah. way. That's the other side of that. It's like that hour, maybe 45 minutes, maybe hour and a half that you get of stage time on that stage, as soon as you're done playing, 
they're pulling your stuff off and you got to make sure that you know where it is because they're making room for the next one. Yeah. And it depends on who you're opening for. So if you are just playing in a lineup or if you're the opening act for a bigger a bigger band, like uh, I played with a group that we opened for Boys to Men and uh, literally as soon as we were done and they were getting ready for the headliner, they were like grabbing our stuff and putting it on the side of the stage and like off to in, into an area that we were like, okay, where's our stuff? Because yeah. they're just trying to move you off the space. That's it. They, they and that's have like stressful. A ten, ten minute turnaround to get you off the stage in a lot of those situations. <clears throat> Sometimes a little bit more, but man, like they, they move you quick when it's like a main headliner stage like that. Like they Absolutely. just want your stuff out of there. And like that happened with me before the same stage. You yeah. know, like before it was, uh, I think it was Phil, uh, Philip Phillips. Yeah. You know, like so like another one we were opening for him, and again like and that time that guy toured with nothing. Like yeah. nothing. It was him, an acoustic guitar, and he brought uh, someone with a hand percussion, and a, a, there was like a, a cello player. That's oh, what it was. nice! So cellist. it was cellist, cellist. <laughs> it, so like just the, it was that was their trio, and there was nothing on stage besides DI boxes and carpets. Yeah. But they still had to hurry to get our stuff out of the way because they don't want you up there when the main yeah. acts coming up. Yeah, they want you gone. I mean, even for us, I mean, like they uh, the setup situation was like they wanted you there hours early. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a, they set up all their back line for Boys to Men, so they had all their stuff. They had a full band, and those guys were actually decent musicians, man. Mm-hmm. They were really good. They uh, all of them play instruments. They don't just sing. They are, and the stuff they covered was amazing. But at the same time, it was like they took the whole sound check period. They gave us two minutes to basically load our stuff, yeah. sound check, and then it was like as soon as we were done, they were already just grabbing our stuff with it. Like it wasn't even unplugged yet and dragging it off the stage. And we're like, okay, give us a, you know a minute yeah. to unplug. And, th- and that's a line check, really. Yeah, yeah, because their stuff was just in front of ours. It wasn't it wasn't a big deal at all. So it was just a matter of getting it off the stage. Yeah, it's just a, a quick little line check to make sure that okay, can, can we see you? Can we hear you? Good, you're ready for work. Like yep, yep, <laughs> that's all it is. But yeah, back to like the music festival thing. Is it worth everyone's time? Is it like worth? Uh, going and like doing it I mean like it's cool I think it's another thing to check off on your little resume of like being a musician like the things that you've accomplished and like hey I played this festival that's great cool yeah do you want to play it every year I mean that's up to you did you see a return on investment as Steve yeah. said before do you did you get that return on investment do you have new followers did you get enough people buying merch that made it worth your time being there if not maybe it was just a good experience and you just want to move on yeah yeah, and I think, you know, and then there's always those bands that, like, we have a pretty large music festival that happens every year in our neighborhood, um, and you have the same acts that play every single year that never change. Like, they are just in, and they play every year, and uh, you're up against them. So you're always you're always fighting, if you decide that you want to go that route, you're fighting for a spot while these other people just kind of waltz in and get the table right away. They don't even have to say anything. They just kind of like, well, I know I'm going to get invited. Yeah. So they just kind of like sit around waiting to get tapped on the shoulder. Like, okay, come, come with us. You, yeah. Here's money for you because, you know, we feel obligated to. Yeah. You're a local celebrity. Here you are. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't mean anything. All right. So summer festivals yep. do or do not. It's up to you. you yeah, know? it really is. Like Try I said it out. before, it, it's, yeah. you know, it might just be a good experience if it's worth it. Like if you do it and like you find that you made some money doing it and, it, and like it was a great experience for everybody involved. Yeah. Yeah. Do it again. Be, be humble about it though, because the reality is that, you know, yeah, you did it this time, but you might not get it next time. Yeah. Enjoy, enjoy the moment up on like the big stage if you get it. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's move on to our final topic today. And this one we could probably keep short. Mm-hmm. Now this one is one that I always see coming up in, in different discussion boards. Yep. And this is the iPad on stage. Mm-hmm. Now, I would argue that the iPad on stage can mean a couple things, right? It can mean a couple things. I can tell you for myself, I use it as a set list. So I have my set list on it, and I have our 400 songs that we do. Mm-hmm. So I might alter the set list as we're playing because I want to see what we have. I don't really use it for, for music, mm-hmm. but I do use it for that, and I might use it to actually play music in between sets. So I use it that way. Sure. But some people are keeping their lead sheets on there or their lyrics. Mm-hmm. Now, do you, if I think if you're using it as a a reminder, you know, hey, what's that bridge again? Or what's the lyrics? On, let me take a look real quick. That's one thing. But if you're reading it while you're doing it for the first time or you're using it as a crutch, mm-hmm. I think that's problematic. What do you say? Well, 
uh, yeah, I, I would kind of agree with what where you're going with this because like I I feel as well that it can be like a crutch. It's not a great look, but I think the the gig matters too. So like, if you were filling in for a band and they give you fifty some odd songs that they want you to go and pr- uh, perform with them, and it's good. The gigs is Friday. It's Tuesday. You have three days to prep. Well, that's like a lot of material. And like, if you have family, a day job, all the other things that go on in like a regular person's yeah. life, that's that's a lot of commitment to try and learn all that material, or at least like run through it. You should try and run through the material yeah. ahead of time. But you know what? Grab those lead sheets, or grab like a <clears throat> chord chart or something like that, and then like throw it on the iPad and that helps you get through that gig because let's face it if you're subbing for a band it's not like a big gig that they're really super concerned about necessarily because otherwise they would have their main people there or they would cancel it yeah or they would cancel it exactly it's not like a detrimental gig for them uh, but they just need somebody there that, that can play it's proficient that's what they're looking for so in a sub situation okay yeah you get a pass on that uh, if you are a regular member in a band and you're using it as Steve's just stated like using it for your lead sheets or chord charts it's because you just never bothered to like really learn the material. Yeah. I mean like okay, you can play, but like did you actually learn anything? Can you actually do you really know that song? Not really. You're well, just kind of like And I think at some point the song starts to you you should be learning the song even if you're doing that. At some point the song goes away. Sorry, the tree is I know uh, it's 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 raining, <laughs> not raining, but the tree is a uh, the bur- I think it's a spruce and it's just dropping its uh seed on me. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um it's it's rain it's raining seeds back here, um, but I think if you you should be learning the chart while you're doing it, even if you're playing through it, because a lot of bands don't rehearse, they don't practice. Right. Uh, and I know my like my band, we don't practice or rehearse. Like you come, you, you learn the song on your own, you show up, and we're gonna try to run it as close to the recording that we shared. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, here's the recording. Try to run it down. I mean, it's 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 a fun band. It's not it's not. We're not planning on taking making it huge with that band. It's just for fun. Yeah, exactly um, as it should be. So we run through it and we're like, okay, let's let's try it live. And that's always the first time we play through it. So sometimes you might need, you know, the chart and to look through it because sometimes there might be sections that you're not familiar with. So if you do use it as a guide, but eventually if you play the song enough and you cycle through the songs, you know, you, you should learn it. But what I find happens too is that if you have enough songs, if you have 400 some songs, you might forget that song by the time you come back to it. Cause somebody always calls a song that you guys, it's like, you guys know this song. It's like, yeah, we haven't played that song in about four years. And yeah. so you're pulling it out and you're, you're trying to remember it on the spot. And sometimes that does happen and you have to, you have to kind of go through the chart and go, okay, well, here's the, here's the big yeah, change. There's been lots of times where I've just kind of like, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. Here we go. I'm just <laughs> yeah. going to, I'm going to trust my muscle memory and just kind of listen for the changes and just like use my relative pitch to kind of be like, and it's one to six and four. And so I'm just, like, I'm yeah. just trying to like follow where the tune is going. Yeah. And they like do it that way. Which I mean, like as a bass player, we can kind of get away with that sometimes just by trusting our ear and knowing where things kind of like fall. Like if you're the guitarist and you have to play like the lead lick in the song, uh, yeah, you better yeah. make sure you actually know how to play it. And there are and, and there's certain things that you have to know. Like there's certain licks like you want to make sure if there's a lick in a song, even bass lines, there's a bass line that kind of drives a song. Like, you're not going to play for the love of money and not play that bass line. Right. If you don't play that bass line for the love of money, <laughs> it's just wrong. You know, you're, you're, it's, it could be your version of it, but it's not, it's not going to be right. Cause there's, there's certain lines that you hear and you're like, the bass drives that, that song. Now let's, let's talk about like bigger gigs or like bigger stages and different scenarios with that where there might be an iPad like on the screen. I've seen it before where vocalists will Mm -hmm. use it as like a reminder for lyrics because let's face it, like when there's like a ton of songs, you know, like it's, it's uh, something where it'd be good to have that little bit of a reminder. Even it's just like you look at it for the first line of that verse and that gets you your brain like activated for like okay these lines you know that's okay i get it but like you know don't go out there and get like the ipad pro which is like that that really 13 inch yeah don't don't do the 13 inch i mean like if you're tucked in the background you're hiding out like i've done it before i have like one of those 12 inch pros and i've used it on like you know the gigs like i'm in the background stick it low i mean even if you are in the front put it low it doesn't need to be because the screen is so large because you are still doing a show people still want to see you 
you. They don't want to see a black box. Yeah, I've seen where you were standing in uh, like in Nashville. I see this with a lot of those bands who are, like typically always <clears> covering <throat> like yeah, they, they cover tons of tunes and like for twenty bucks they'll play whatever song you want them to play. <laughs> what do they do? They go and they have like the gigantic iPhone. So yeah. they, they go and they'll, they'll pull the song up this way and they just have like a little stand like right next to their microphone and they're 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 following it just like this. Which is that a problem? No, I don't think it's a problem, especially when they're doing requests for people. Especially well, I think it, I think at that point then it's like you know the right tool for the right job yes you know is it the right tool for the right job in that situation yes because that's you need that tool to be able to know that song otherwise it's like i think we kind of know it you know what's the changes in that if we can all agree to what those changes should be and we start working through that that would be that would be ideal yeah now so tele televised performances yeah no ipads no ipads or or place them on the floor you know, with a big enough screen, you can place it on the floor. You can look down for a second. Oh, you're talking about like a like teleprompter a, almost at that yeah, point. Yeah, you just put it on yeah. the floor. You can look down and see it just so if you need to see what the songs are. I mean, because, I mean, we've all had, I've, everybody puts their set list on the floor. Yes. You know? The iPad can sit on the floor. Just don't that's step true. on it. That's true. That's actually, that, you need that's Apple not a bad then. point. <laughs> that's not a bad point, though. Like, you know, if you, if you absolutely need it, hide it better. <clears throat> yep. Place Don't it out of the view, in front of your face. Yeah. I mean, like I've seen Radiohead before, where Johnny Greenwood is literally just sitting there. He's got two music stands, like like back to back, and he's yeah. like reading the tune <laughs> as it goes across. And it's like, hey, but he gets away with it because he's John. He's, he's yeah. it's Colin, Colin Greenwood. Greenwood. Yeah. Colin Greenwood's doing yep. that. Yeah, he was, yeah. I think that was for like Airbag back in the day. He because like the baseline didn't repeat. Well, they cut it. That was they, 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 yeah. But then they he had to learn it. it. Yeah, he had to but then he had to learn it. it. And he's sitting there and he's reading it for the first few times they yeah. were playing it live. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's that's impressive though. I mean, when you think about just a sidetrack for that for yeah. a minute, but Airbag was like they recorded this song, and that's Tom York for you, right? Yeah, he took the song, know. cut up the bass line, and replaced it from parts that he played and created this this whole other piece. Yeah, which is pretty wild when you think about it. It's it was like, super impressive, and then. Colin liked it so much better than what he played. He's yeah. like, I'm learning it the way that they recorded it. And like, I remember when I had to learn that, that was so difficult. Yeah, that's, <laughs> there is, there is a repeat in there, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, it, you, you play, it's, it, the phrases aren't, aren't the way that bass players would normally play a phrase. Right. <laughs> it's, it's all chopped up. Towards the end, there is a lot more repeating going yeah. on, but yeah. So yeah. Like, either way, I it's digress. A, it's a bass part. Yeah. I digress. So, so iPads on stage, maybe. <laughs> maybe maybe i like that uh, use, answer use it right yeah i hide it if uh, if possible if you can't it hide low. it then like you know use use the right tool for the right job mm. you know if you feel that like it's not going to give you the right look like if you're going to be like performing on like a stage in a theater or something like that and you know eyes are going to be on you it's like you know maybe maybe you try to actually learn the material and like you know because it's in those situations it'd be like a 90 minute show you can learn 90 minutes of music. I think placement's important too. So I mean, if you if you can place it low enough and then you walk away from it, if you just need to look at it for like a few bars mm-hmm. and not just stare at it the entire time. Yes. There's always that guy that like stares at the page. I mean, we used to have that problem with like even like in in jazz band, like in in college, you'd mm-hmm. have the guy that can't bring his eyes off the chart. He's just staring at the chart the whole time. So you have to kind of lift your head, look around, move around, come back to it. Okay, I mm-hmm. see where I'm at. Okay. And, and if you place it on the side, like I have, I have a stand that I have connected to my mic um, that I keep really low. So it's, I have it again, like I said, for the, our set list, because there's yeah, like 400 some songs. Face. It's, it's way low. Mm-hmm. So I can, I just have it tilted back. So like, like a teleprompter. So mm-hmm. enough that I can see it and move on. Yeah. I, when I did one of the Elvis tribute shows before, I needed the iPad for one song. There was just one song I could yep. not commit to memory. It was like one of the, the gospel tunes that they were doing. And instead of putting it in front of my face like this when I went to go play that yeah. song, I had it off to the side, kind of like almost at an angle with the audience. Mm-hmm. So like it was like, instead of seeing them seeing like a big flat face oh, on the iPad, yeah, that makes they sense. saw a sliver of yeah. of something there, and like it was almost like camouflage. It's like then. a flashcard then versus a versus a book. Yeah. You know, so like not... that's down here while I'm playing. I just kind of like glance over and I can see what I'm playing, and then in front of me it's just the audience. So therefore, it was a little bit more kind of like me trying to hide it that I needed it for that one. Oh, song. you know, nobody really wants to see you anyway. Well, I, <laughs> I know it's it's not about me. Well, even that nobody wants to see. But you. I want it to be about me. <laughs> you want to be seen. I want it to be about me. Damn it! You're not Elvis. <laughs> no, you're I'll not. Ne- Elvis. I'll never be Elvis. <laughs> None of us will ever be Elvis. <laughs> uh, so shall we move on to the? Yeah. To the, the the it's cool, but like, is it necessary? Yeah, you know, is it cool, but is it necessary? Sure, it's awesome, but is it necessary? That's the that's, that's the proper it. verbiage there. It's awesome, <laughs> but is it necessary? Sure, it's awesome, 
but is it necessary? So Sean did not bring anything today. Slacker. No, I know. He's slacker. Sorry. Of course, I, I moved the time frame up because this month was kind of crazy for me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of personal stuff. Yeah, a lot of personal stuff. Uh, to be completely candid, uh, my wife had to have surgery, and um, so this is coming to us late. She had uh, stage four cancer, and she had to get operated on and have some tumors removed. And thank God, she's in a great place for recovery. Um, so we are in a great place, but it did kind of tie up my time for this month. I was really, um, it was hard to get here. And um, the family's got to come first. I abso- think that's just the way it is. Absolutely. So, um so I kind of pulled our things together. I did move the time up on you. I was like, hey, let's get this recorded no, a little bit faster. That's fine. But yeah. I brought, I think we're going to be pedal heavy today. Um, and and there's, two, there's three pedals. And I did organize, I know we talked about the Noble last time. And I did mount the Noble on a pedal board. Um, and I, I kind of created the best pedal board ever. Um, you, ever. You know, like uh, uh, opinions don't matter in this. This is apparently it, fact. Now. It is, it is fact. I mean, I brought this into the <laughs> studio and. And the Chuck Hammer said, this is the best thing I've ever heard. And I'm not going to lie, the, the setup is amazing. But I'm not talking about the entire pedal board. I'm actually just talking about one pedal on there. But actually two pedals on there. Yeah. But I am going to go and I want to bring up one thing first. I'm going to bring up the bass mono synth. Mm-hmm. This is an interesting pedal. I use it very sparingly, if not almost never. Um, <laughs> I like That's a it. Great way to say like it's awesome. <laughs> it but is, is awesome. It necessary? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I like the pedal a lot. the The fabrication of it is awesome. It's an electro harmonics pedal, which means that it's not a lot of money. It's mm-hmm. it's a lot of money for electro harmonics. Let's be honest. But it's not a lot in the scheme of things. What are they going for? I think it was like three hundred bucks, maybe a little bit less. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's a steep electro harmonics pedal, but but it's a well made yeah. one. Sure. Like a metal casing. Yes. Yeah. Metal casing. You know, like it, it's got that like powder coat to the the exterior, so like the, it it feels like it's a good pedal. You Absolutely. Know? And, like, the oh and these ones aren't even like the the, the click one these are like the newer the newer yep. actual like stomp like switches yeah so like and and that's kind of nice i do like that element of it because the other ones that tend to click like i have like one of like the 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 nano big muffs and like yeah, that one's wear like, out click yeah, yeah. And like, they they do wear out and they when they jump they always jump when you click it this one this one is smooth it does give you the ability to uh connect a uh you can actually connect an expression pedal so you can get a lot out of this effect I just found in my world of, of usefulness, it is not one that I use very often. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it does have its place. I think I wanted to do, uh, I love Scary Pockets, or not even, it's not Scary Pockets, it was actually uh, the Moose, uh, the other one they have. Uh, what's the other name? Uh, uh, I don't know. It's the guys from Scary Pockets, mm-hmm. uh, but they did a cover of uh, Old Town Road oh, okay. and, and, uh, and the Genuine song that... Uh, uh, What's that genuine song? Um, I don't follow those artists. It, he did. They did a really nice mashup, but it has like this bass synth effect, and I found that this pedal will get that that synth effect. Okay. Uh, it was a mashup of Old Town Road and uh, not. Uh, I'll have to look that up, but. Uh, yeah. Well, the bass synth stuff is always kind of interesting to me because like. It all depends on like the type of synth sound that you're getting out of it. That like you know whether or not I would find like uh, value in this. And now like I know like a majority of what like you and I uh, would play. And, hold oh, on. Go ahead. I got it. I got it. So it's it's uh, actually Pomplamoose, and it is uh, Old Town Road and Pony mashup. Very cool song. Uh, and this effect was the only time I've ever really found the use for this effect is in covering that song okay. from their version doing that mashup. But go yeah, ahead. I digress. Th- yeah. No. There's. Um, specific times where you might want like a mono synth or, or even just like a bass synth effect in general i know majority of the things i would say like 99 percent of the music that i'm gonna play i'm not gonna need something like this and like for you same yeah. same kind of deal this is something where like you're doing something very niche it's very particular it's yep. a certain sound and you want to make it sound authentic to the recording then yeah, then that's something you're gonna want to go with. I remember I had one of those electro harmonics like micro synth ones with yeah. all the all the yep. faders on all it. Sw- yeah. I used it for one song. <laughs> yeah, I, it was a, all all you need from Radiohead. Yeah, that, like, well that would make oh, sense. Nah, 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 yeah, because nah, nah, you need, nah, yeah, you need yeah. that effect. It, but it was like a, a square wave aggressive kind of yeah. like synth. Yep, and that's so, this has it in there. Yeah, so, so there you, you go. So this is this is you definitely have to kind of go with a plan for something like this. Mm-hmm. So is it necessary? I say no. You agree. Yeah, right. I agree. It's definitely not necessary. 
but it is awesome. It is awesome. It is <laughs> cool. I mean, you're not gonna you're you're not gonna not love it until you sell it. <laughs> yeah, or, it's kind of like a boat. Yeah. <laughs> happy when you buy it. Happy when you sell it. Yeah, it's it's cool though. It's definitely a cool effect. Now the next one I'm I'm bringing up now. I I, I want to do a review on this. I know there's been a bunch of reviews uh, from other other people. Sorry for the background. We we're doing it outside. We're recording yeah. outside, so we have somebody who's going wild with the uh, the weed whacker. Oh, that, and then we also get like the airplanes. Yeah, I live too. close to the airport. Um, <laughs> So the next one we're going to talk about, and it's on my awesome, most awesome pedal board. The yes. most awesome. Can we Must. tilt it, tilt it yep, up? Yeah, that's the go. plan. Okay. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to talk about this pedal right here. This is the Cali 76. This is a bass compressor. This is the new one. Mm -hmm. This is a really, really great bass compressor. Um, it can go direct. It has a 24 watts option, so you can run it directly into recording level wattage. Okay. So if you want to run directly into the board, uh, it is a studio grade compressor. Okay, that's, uh, that's kind of nice to have that on a board. It's it has also has a dry uh, so it has a dual compression that you can add in a dry the dry element, mm -hmm. so you can get a really natural sounding compression. It is similar to the other ones that they've done in the past. Um, I've never been a compression person until I got this pedal. Yeah. And it is phenomenal. Yeah, there's only been a couple of times I've really played with compression. And uh, it was usually when I really wanted to be able to accentuate every single note on the on the bass. Because, like, you, you know for a fact that, yeah. like, there are certain regions of the neck that just kind of, like, get lost in the mix, like, when you're playing. Like, Absolutely. So, like... The, um, the lower notes on like the G or the D string sometimes like they, they just don't push as much so yeah. then like if you use a little bit of compression it kind of evens out all the strings evens out the notes and you get sometimes like a little bit more like sustain out of yep. it as well so yeah. it, it it's like um, the way I've always understood compression it was kind of like putting like your, your thumb over top of like a like a hose like a garden hose almost it's kind of like it's pushing directs this, it the, yeah, it, directs it, the yeah. sound so it's not just kind of like <clears throat> such a loose tone it's it's more just like direct it's punchier i don't know like i, I think there's a there's a lot of good use for compression yeah. and it can be pretty versatile you es know for what you're using it for. especially depending on the room you're in sometimes you have to and that's one of the things that i've been really uh, aware of is like depending on the room you're in compression can make or break the bass signal yeah because if the room is is a, has a certain quality yeah, certain sounds in the room just because the bass functions in a certain way that it just doesn't sound good yeah. uh the compression will actually really help to dial in that sound now i think a compression is it's a big it's a big wave and what happens is when you compress the signal you're cutting off the tip of the of the top of the wave and the bottom of the wave and compressing it into a range that is more audible and mm -hmm. it, it just is it's a nicer tone now you don't get some of the some of the other factors of, of the natural signal are can be lost, and that's where they kind of bring in that dry element. So uh, this pedal is about four hundred dollars. Yeah, so, so it's, it's not, not entry cheap. level. It is not, but it is worth the money because the quality of what you're getting out of it is incredible. Mm -hmm. It is a worthwhile pedal, and I'm gonna I, I am gonna go more in depth on it uh, in the next month or so. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it from a standpoint because everybody's done the review of the basic like here's what it does right what i want to do is i want to actually show you on the gig and like play it and show you what it sounds like out there the difference that yeah. you're going to hear yeah. in, in the reality of the room uh but this is a really great pedal now is it meant for everybody it's it's a big steep chunk of change mm -hmm. and um and we always talk about the bar band like we talked about the the noble last time is the noble you know do you need it for a bar band gig and the answer for that was no but it's nice yeah uh this one you can get by, you could probably buy another compressor pedal out there that's a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, I've had some in the past. I had another one that I was using. And uh, I had an MXR, which was decent. I ended up giving sure. it to a student because I was like, you know what, I got this. This thing is amazing. And I was never a compression person. I, you know, I was like, you know, let me see how it goes. I, I use it for certain things. I use this pedal board for recording a lot. I've been, this has been the request lately from everybody that I've been doing session work with. I've been. I brought it out to one session, showed them what it did, and they were like, "Okay, we want this." Sure. Yeah. And this this array here, what I have lined up here, is monstrous on, uh, in session work. It oh, just, absolutely. It I mean, just, sounds... just looking at the, the the setup, it's it definitely will get you just about whatever sound you really want to get out. And of it's that. it's not an effect sound. It's just no. it's just it cleans up the tone. It's a signal. It it just it's it, it just fattens up your signal. Yeah, and I, and I'll say like you know when it comes to like the bar band gig. 
you know, like you can absolutely get by with a cheaper, simpler yeah. compression because again, the sound isn't, I guess, as important you Correct. Know, at that point, you know, yeah. but like when you are doing session work, that's when like every little nuance matters, like every little absolutely. thing that you're doing. And that's why people will sit there and tweak pedals for hours, just kind of like getting it to where they're perfectly happy with how each one of the notes are going to sound. But that might change depending on the room. Well, that's why you do it in the room sometimes. Yep. Like sometimes you're gonna sit there and just kind of tweak something, and something you typically always do, and like in your uh, your your practice space or whatever, it doesn't sound the same when you're at the studio or when you're at the gig or whatnot. Yep. So you're gonna end up tweaking things around a little bit. So is it necessary? I think compression is a necessary tool. Um, is this one necessary for session work? Yes. Uh, bar band optional. Maybe, maybe. yeah. If, if you have the money, yeah. do it. Yeah. If you have the money, do it. So the last one I want to talk about for sure, it's it's awesome, but is it necessary, is actually going to be the Peterson strobe tuner. Strobe tuner on the pedal board, exactly. Okay. Is a tuner, or any tuner, I, I have the Peterson strobe on there, but a tuner on your pedal board, is it, it's awesome, mm -hmm. but is it necessary? What's uh, your thoughts? I a, a pedal tuner absolutely necessary. Yeah. It's it's that should be like you know one of the first things as yes. like a beginner student you should buy is a tuner because well, nothing <clears throat> sounds worse even if like you have no other effects and you just have like bass cable amp yeah like you or guitar doesn't matter you want to be in tune more than anything well, and why is it why is the pedal tuner so important because I see a lot of people that show up and they have the tuner they have a box tuner they throw it yeah. in tune it real quick plug it in. And that's and that's awesome, especially if you're going for that really direct sound and you want to cut every every element out of like that's because every every pedal that you go through, if it even with true bypass, you do lose mm -hmm. some signal. Yeah. So it's like oh, I'm gonna add another pedal, so you might lose a little bit of signal. Now I tell you, this one does not. This mm -hmm. one's pretty good, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but having it on a pedal board now, this one works as a mute as well. So when you plug mm -hmm. in, you can tune between songs. I yep. find that important because a lot of people don't. Sometimes they don't check their tuning. You start their set out halfway through the set. You notice things are kind of wonky. You're like, something's out here. Yeah, you got to check. Yeah, check yeah, your having, tuning. Having something on the board that you can quickly just tap and like, okay, let me just Glance check at, yep. it real quick and then move on. Like it can take like, you know, 10, 15 seconds. It doesn't have to take that long to check your tuning. I use two different tuners myself. I don't have the Peterson one, but I use a... Uh, Oh, is it uh, just like a, a polytune, like yeah, a TC electronic polytune? Yeah. I use like a mini That's poly right, tune on my on my one board because it takes very minimal real estate. This is small too. Yeah. It's very small <clears throat> real estate, and it's something that I can visually see easily, like in a dark room or even like on a, the day gig during the yeah. summer festivals when like yep. the sun's blaring. I'll tell you which one's not easy to see, it, and I use it too for like my my smaller board for yeah. traveling is the the Boss uh, tuner, like mm. the TU two or whatever mm -hmm. it is, like the the the, the white one yeah that one it's it's fantastic if you want to use like a daisy chain because like it has a built-in buffer to it and whatnot like that's a that's a multifunctional cool pedal yeah, to have absolutely but daytime summer gigs you can't see the leds like yeah. it's very it you're hard like, what what yeah. is that yeah so like that one's not so good I, this one is much more visible same thing with the polytune uh, you need to have a tuner yeah. uh, uh, on your thing. And I have seen the people who use like the, 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 headstock, the, tuners. the headstock clip tuners. Some of them work pretty yeah. decently. Some of them don't, but I'll tell you what they don't do well is when you're on stage and you roll the volume off and you're trying to like uh, check the volume. There's so much ambient noise and so many other things going on. Like it's supposed to work off a of vibration. <clears throat> yeah. The things just that they, they can't register. <laughs> and then now you are up against the wall. You're trying to figure out like, well, how do I, how do I get the tuning to work? Right. It, you're squeezing it on the head to try and get the sound. Yep. It's, it's a complete waste of time. Yeah. Don't put yourself in that situation. It's it, you'll, you'll have some much anxiety thinking about sure, it sure sure so uh, we both agree the yes. tuner is necessary pedal board tuner is necessary mm -hmm. it's it's worth the, it's worth the investment uh just buy it even if just you don't have it. a pedal board just put it in your gig bag and then like yeah. th throw a nine volt in the thing that th they'll last for months yeah 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 Re i found mine i think i bought mine through reverb.com because i just wanted i wanted this strobe one i wanted the peterson strobe one because i like the peterson stuff yeah but you know that's that's it so we agree so so think about your pedal choices you know uh sometimes we buy things because they're cool but you know they're not always necessary right 
Um, and then it comes to the point of like, how do you get rid of that? And a lot of times we end up giving it away. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of times you're just going to end up as like, well, I can't sell this because nobody else wants it. So now I'm just going to give it to somebody who or, might enjoy it. Or is it even bit. worth the tr trying to sell it? You know, sometimes you have things and you're like, do I really even want to try to sell this? I'm just going to I'm just going to give it away cuz I don't I don't want to go through the hassle of having to like you know take it to a shop or place it online and wait 6 to 10 months while while it sits there. Right. You know, so sometimes that's a hassle. So all right friends, so this concludes our third episode. Thank you again for tuning Thank you. in. Yeah. Make sure that you uh, share, like, subscribe, all the all the internet things that you're supposed to be doing. Those those are always helpful. And I want to give one quick shout out to uh, Warwick too. We got, I got this pedal board a few years ago. We're doing a review for Bass Musician Magazine, and uh, they sent this to me. And I've found several ways to reuse this board over and over again. And uh, the Warwick pedal boards, the rock boards, are awesome. Um, another shout out to them because. I got two from them, and they are worthwhile. They are well-constructed, um, really well-built boards. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to give a shout-out to them because I'm, I am using it yet again in a different configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we want to thank our host, Bass Musician Magazine. Remember to like and subscribe Bass Musician Magazine. Stay up to date with them because Bass Musician Magazine is the face of bass, and we're going to bring you the latest and greatest of what's going on in the bass world. Uh, there's always great interviews. There's always great product reviews. Bass Musician Magazine is the place to connect with other bass players. And again, just for me and Sean, I want to say thank you for tuning in with us. I hope you learned something or at least were entertained for the last uh, too long that we spent doing this. Again. We, we decided we are going to cut it down, but hey, it, it goes a little bit longer. But uh, we enjoy doing this for you. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, rem remember to uh, let us know what's on your mind. Definitely uh, comment. Uh, so like, subscribe, comment. Uh, both uh, Sean and I are both on uh, Instagram, mm -hmm. so if you want to follow us on Instagram and ask us questions there, I'm Steve the Bass Guy on uh, Instagram, and you are I'm Sean Cav on Instagram. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, but yeah. who uses that anymore, really? Uh, I'm on X most of the time. Yeah. So. Yeah. So definitely Instagram, Instagram, and uh, also YouTube. YouTube is the place as well. But remember to like and subscribe and follow us, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Be Take well. Care.